Hi, and thanks for tuning in for today's Connect video, Tuesday, June 7th. And um, some announcements and reminders for you here today. And um, Young at Heart, our senior adult ministry, has a number of things planned this summer. So make sure you're keeping your eyes and ears open. Check out the ministry events page on the website and the church app for those things. And summer barbecues are ramping up. We have three barbecues now that are open for signups, and we're waiting and wanting more hosts for these things. But um, you can check out again on the church website, the events page, or in the church app for uh, signups for that and information. And Next Gen Kids is uh, in the midst of a busy summer, I guess on the front end of the busy summer still. They have the uh, Southern Arizona Reptile Rescue here this uh is it Thursday or Friday, June 9th? Thursday, right? June 9th. And um, this coming Sunday is Promotion Sunday. Always an exciting Sunday for the kids as they move up to the next next class. So uh, that's coming up this Thursday and then this Sunday. Next Gen Students be in prayer for our students' middle school summer camp is happening right now. This week at Glorieta, New Mexico, in Glorieta, New Mexico, at the camp there. So be in prayer for them. They come back on Thursday night. And lastly, Hands of Hope. We're doing a diaper and wipes drive, partnering with them this coming Sunday and the following Sunday, June 12th and 9th. You can bring in uh, diapers or wipes uh, on the next couple of Sundays. You can bring them in during the week also and drop them off here in the lower lobby. Um, but on Sunday the 12th and the 9th in the upper lobby, there'll be a table up there. You can bring uh, those items and drop them off on those Sundays. If you want more information, need more information, you can call Nellie Holst, and her number there is on the screen. So a lot of things happening, so it's an exciting time. Uh, summer doesn't slow down. It actually speeds up around here. Um, so we're in the midst of our video series here on Christian Denominations trying to answer, you know, why are there so many denominations and how did they start? What do they believe? Some of the differences between them. We're currently looking at the five branches of Protestant, Protestantism, the five major branches. And so far we've covered the Lutheran Church, the Anglican Church. Last week we looked at the Presbyterian Church, and today we're looking at the Methodist Church or Methodism. So how did the Methodist Church, how did Methodism start? Well, the start of the Methodist Church goes back to the early 1700s. John Wesley is credited as one of the co-founders of the Methodist Church. He remained a member of the Church of England until his death. He never wanted to start a new denomination uh, separate from the Anglican Church. John's brother Charles, there are two of 19 children, by the way, Charles is also credited as being one of the founders of the Methodist Church. While attending Oxford University in England, John and Charles and several other students created a Bible study group called the Holy Club. They were disenchanted by the lack of holiness in the Christians that they knew, so they wanted to get a group together to study the Bible so they could live more holy lives. You can, you can say, in a sense, the Methodist Church began as a reform movement within the Church of England or within the Anglican Church. They had very specific guidelines and rules for their study, very specific methods they used to study the Bible, and soon others started calling the group Methodists as a derogatory and disrespectful term, but the Wesley brothers embraced the name as a badge of honor, in 1738, after spending some time in America and returning to England, John was at a spiritual low point. He was very disillusioned with a number of things. And he was advised by a Moravian priest to begin preaching evangelistic sermons, emphasizing conversions and holiness living. And as odd as it sounds, that practice got... John and Charles into trouble with the Church of England, and they were barred from English pulpits. And so they began preaching anywhere people would gather, even outside and in barns and in open fields. And at that time, that was unheard of, right? To just preach out in the open. 
Soon, George Whitfield joined the Wesley brothers, and with his powerful preaching, also art outdoors in many instances, that helped this the Methodist church take shape. Now, Whitfield was more Calvinistic in his theology than the Wesleys, and that caused them to eventually part ways. But at first, those who followed these three preachers established groups within the Anglican Church. However, these groups eventually formed their own denomination, and the Methodist Church had its first conference in 1744. In the 1800s, in the United States, there was a large split in the Methodist Church due to slavery, and the African Methodist Episcopal Church, or the AME as it's most commonly known, and there were other offshoot groups at this time also, quite a few of them. But the AME is the, probably the, the most significant group that emerged from that split. Historians tell us that John Wesley preached sermons, more than 40,000 sermons in his lifetime. And he was still preaching at age 88, just a few days before he died in 1791. Now what about the Methodist Church? It's governance and structure and things like that. Local Methodist churches are called charges, and clergy for each church is appointed by the bishop at the annual conference. Uh, representatives from, from churches meet every four years at the general conference, which is a worldwide conference. And what about its theology and the sacraments? Uh, the theology in Methodist churches tends to be more Arminian, which stresses the free will of the individual along with some other things, but free will is a big deal. There's a variety, a wide variety of biblical interpretation in Methodist churches, from very, very liberal interpretations to very conservative interpretations of Scripture, and practices follow along those interpretations. Uh, there are well, sacraments. There are two sacraments in the Methodist church, baptism and communion. And baptism is administered to both adults and infants, and sprinkling is the typical mode for baptism, but some churches will use pouring and other means. The worship and liturgy in the church is based on the English prayer book and based on a lot of uh, John Wesley's writings, but there is not a uniform style or pattern of worship in each and every church. That It'll be the same. It will vary. There is some freedom within the Methodist um, denomination with how each church crafts its services and so on. I thought this was a bit interesting. Notable Methodists. So Isaac Watts, the great hymn writer, was a Methodist. William Wilberforce, the English philanthropist and abolitionist, he was a Methodist. Um, and then we find um, Beyonce <laughs> is a was raised Methodist. President George W. Bush is a faithful Methodist. Hillary Clinton. Rosa Parks was part of the AME, the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And the great baseball player Jackie Robinson, I believe I read he became saved in a Methodist when he was a teenager and was a faithful part of the Methodist Church throughout his whole life. How many, how many Methodists are there? Uh, in the United States, the United Methodist Church is the largest group in America. Today, the number of Methodists worldwide is estimated to be around 75 million. It's a large denomination, and um, it's estimates 60 to 80 million in that range, um, but quite a, quite a large group around the world. These are the sources I use today to gather some of the information for this video. So if you want to dig a little bit deeper, you can in those sources. But I hope this helps you understand a little bit more about the Methodist Church and how it started and some of the details of it. And uh, would you pray with me today as we kind of look towards the rest of our week? Father, help us as we, um, Lord, try and follow your will as we try to live holy lives as we try to learn what Scripture says and, and then mold our life to what it says. Help us to do that, Lord. That's, uh, that's kind of one of the hallmarks. The other hallmark here is, is how engaged they were in social work and just that holiness is not just a church thing, but how they lived in, in, in the world, in their everyday life, and it affected how they viewed people. So, Lord, that, 
that's that's what your word directs. So I pray that we would have that same desire to see people as you see them and then act upon the promptings you give us and do things to bring your love and grace and justice to uh, to the world around us. So we pray for these things and guide us and direct us throughout this week. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, I hope that is a little bit helpful. We'll see you this coming Sunday, 9.30 or 11. And uh, uh, the live stream will be, be available, but we'd love to have you with us in person if that's possible. Have an awesome week and be a blessing. Bye-bye.